Praise the Lord. Well, bump your neighbor, tell them happy Wednesday, and you can be seated. Glory to God. Open your Bible to Genesis chapter number 14. We're going to read a couple of verses there around verse 14. So 14, 14. Then stick your finger there if you're using a paper Bible and flip all the way over to the Gospel of John, chapter number 3. John, chapter number 3. So Genesis 14 and John, chapter number 3. We are in the middle of uh, an overthrow in the Brazos Valley. What's happening is the kingdom of heaven is ransacking the kingdom of darkness. And what's going to happen, the result of this overthrow, is we're getting it all back. Somebody give God a shout. We're getting it all back. We're getting all of our joy back. We're getting all of our peace back. We're getting all of our family members back. We're getting all of our kids back. We're getting all of our sleep back. Some of y'all was like, what is he even talking about? I sleep like a baby. Well, let me tell you something. Everybody doesn't sleep like a baby. We're getting all of our sleep back. We're getting all of our, our, our wisdom back. We're just going to be good at making good decisions. Amen. We're getting a lot of clarity back. We're getting it all back. We're getting everything the devil has stolen. We're getting it all back in the name of Jesus. And it starts here in the Brazos Valley because that happens to be where we are. However... Uh, it's going to happen in your family, wherever your family is. If they're in, listen, if they're in Houston, praise God. If they're in Dallas, praise God. If they're in Miami, Florida, glory to God. If they're, no, it doesn't matter where they are, we are getting it all back in the name of Jesus. Summer 2017, you mark your calendar and you're going to look back and you say, what happened in the summer of 2017? We got it all back in the summer of 2017. Sometimes the Bible says we got to get a little bit aggressive in this thing. The scripture says the kingdom suffers violence and the violent, and, and the violent we lay in the corner and cry. No, 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 no. The Bible says we take it by force. How do we take it by force? We don't just go grab somebody up by the neck. I know you'd like to, Jethro. You'd like to just go grab them up by the nap of the neck and tell them this and tell them that, but God's a lot better at vengeance than you are. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual things. So the scripture says in Genesis chapter number 14, uh, that Abram, has, his nephew had been kidnapped, and, and when Abram heard about it, here's what happened, Genesis 14, 14. When Abram heard that his brother, was actually his nephew, was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. The scripture says in verse 15, they divided themselves among, against them, he and his servants by night, smote them and pursued them unto Hobah. Everybody say Hobah. Hobah. Everybody say Hobah, Hobah. Hobah. Isn't that a fun one? It's Hebrew. It literally means a hiding place. So the scripture just said, we just read it out loud. The scripture says that Abram and the 318, everybody say 318. The 318 that were born in his house, trained in his house, and armed in his house, pursued those who had kidnapped his nephew all the way to Hobah, which means a place of hiding. In other words, that, that God's people, the kingdom of God, rose up when he heard that there was a, an injustice done. The kingdom of God rose up and pursued the enemy until the enemy was literally hiding, terrified for his life. When you walk in the room, devils start running out of the room in the name of Jesus. How many of you just like the idea of the devil just being petrified of the Jesus on the inside of you? You know what? I gave up fear a long time ago. It didn't ever work for me. 
It, it never helped me to be afraid. Even in, even in fearful situations, fear never helped me. This fear has never been anything other than a motivator that would try to make you to recluse and to withdraw. That's why the devil wants you to stay scared and frightened because if you'll stay scared and frightened, you'll miss the lost person that's at the office next to you that you could be sharing with because you are reclusive in that moment. You are scared and frightened for your own self. That's why the Bible says when, when, when we recognize that something has been done, the kingdom of heaven rises up. And when the kingdom of heaven rises up, he begins to pursue your adversary, the devil, away from you and chases him all the way into a place into a place of hiding which for me and you is really good news the difference is we as Christians we're not called to just be spectators in this no we're called to be participators in this so the scripture says that Abram rose up when he heard about the injustice and they smote him and pursued him all the way to Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus which is approximately just left of the right hand of Damascus verse 16 and he brought back all the goods. Somebody say all the goods. All the goods. And also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women and all the people. One translation says right there, verse 16, says he retrieved all the stolen property. All the stolen property. The summer of 2017, we are going to retrieve all the stolen property. Come on, give God a big hand of praise. Somebody ought to shout, even though you don't even have it yet. Just somebody ought to just say, oh, we're getting it all back. We thank you, God. I thank you for moving on our families. I thank you for moving in our life, oh God. I thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost, oh God. I thank you we're getting it all back this summer. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Or sometimes a good shout will just do you good. I don't like it too quiet. When my kids, it doesn't happen very often, maybe three times in the time we've been married, we've, we've had children, four maybe, our kids have been overnight somewhere, all of them at the same time, and it is like, what has happened in our house, you know? I like a little, I like a little action. I like a little activity. There's a pace in the kingdom of God. The pace in the kingdom of God oftentimes is moving faster than you want to move in the natural. That's how you know it's God because he's always leading you. Jesus is always somewhere in your future. He's also where you are, but he's always somewhere in your future. And he's calling you to a better place. That's why the pace of your life currently might not fit with the pace of what God's calling you to do. What I like is I like to see people that are serious about getting something done. I like to see people that are serious about pursuing something. I like seeing people that are serious about accomplishing a thing. Because God can work with the willing much more than he can work with the able. There's a pace in the kingdom of God. So the Bible says that they pursued, they, 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 they literally went and got all the goods back. They retrieved everything. But I want to focus uh, uh, this week, I want to focus on one of the characteristics of the 318. I'll explain. If you don't know what this board is, I'll explain it in a little bit. But we're in the middle of a, of a program we're calling the 318 Pursuit, where we're literally pursuing. We are going to join together collectively, and we are going to pursue, and we are going to get it all back until the devil is just high hiding like the little pipsqueak that he is. <laughs> Lester Summerall, one of my favorite preachers uh, from days gone by, I never met him personally, but from days gone by, he used to always shout and scream when he talked about the devil. And I remember one time he was asked, how come you always shout when you talk about the devil? He says, I'm trying to remind him what kind of a dog he really is. <laughs> because if you put the devil on a pedestal, let me tell you what he'll do. He'll stand up on the pedestal and look down at you. But if you put him where he belongs, which is under your feet, then you begin to get a, rec a real picture of him. He's no different than a speck of gum you pick up at the Walmart parking lot. He's just a problem on the bottom side of your foot. A stick and a little, a little elbow grease will knock him right off. Glory to God. The devil is a liar. We're getting it all back. So the scripture says that the, that the 318 were born in the house they were trained in the house, and they were armed in the house. I want to talk this, this evening, not too long, but I want to talk this evening about the idea of you being born into the kingdom of God and why the devil hates it so much. 
You see, the reality is, is the Bible makes it clear that we are all born into sin. We're going to go to John chapter 3, those of you who are about to look. Uh, but the Bible says we are all born into sin, uh, which means by one man's failure, we were all kind of grafted into a sin nature through Adam's, uh, Adam's mess up in the garden. We're all into it. And listen, this sermon is not about blaming Adam because trust me, if Adam hadn't done it, you would have. You see what I'm saying? But the Bible says that we're all born into sin, which puts a necessity upon you and me if we're ever going to find ourselves in the presence of the Lord and not be concerned. The necessity is you and me have to be at a place where we are born again. Somebody say born again. We have to get to a place where we are born again. So where we get this phrase in our Bible is in John chapter number three, beginning in verse number one. The scripture says... Uh, Jesus, the scripture says that in the nighttime, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus. So at night, Nicodemus came to Jesus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, now I, I, I want to stop right there for a minute because if you've been in church more than like five minutes, you may have heard the word Pharisee. Raise your hand if you ever heard the word Pharisee. When we hear it, sometimes we like... We, we have heard so much bad stuff about Pharisees that we put all the Pharisees in a pile and we say all the Pharisees are bad and then we put the disciples over here in a pile and we're like, and all the people that were disciples were on Jesus' team except Judas, we're gonna put him somewhere else over there. But we've got the Pharisees and, G and Jesus' team and it's like these two different teams but it's not that way at all. They weren't wearing jerseys. Everybody was just a person that was playing a role in history at that time. They they could not see everything that was taking place. There were Pharisees that were totally against what Jesus was doing. And then there were Pharisees like this man, Nicodemus, who didn't understand it all. They had to have a better definition and a better understanding and a better explanation than just everybody else did because they knew the word of God. They knew what the, what the Torah, they knew what the uh, uh, Hebraic teaching said. So they couldn't just take everything at face value. In other words, Jesus will speak speak to you where you are. If you need more explanation, Jesus is not scared to explain it to you. If you need less explanation and more faith, Jesus is not scared to double, uh, inject you with a double dose of faith. But the Bible says that Nicodemus came to him uh, at nighttime and he said, he said to him, he said, the same came to Jesus by night and said to them, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now, the reason that he knew he was a teacher come from God, because no man can do what you are doing except God be with him. No man can do what you are doing except God be with you. You see, there is something that can be argued. We can argue the legitimacy of prophecy. We can argue the legitimacy of the Word of God in different applications. We can argue the punctuation in the Word of God. We can argue how it was translated from its original text. We can argue who dug uh, what up and who found this. But what you cannot argue is what God has done in your life. Amen. When God does something for you, when he takes a fear and he removes it, and it's replaced with a place of power and strength, when God does something for you and your marriage was on the rocks and shambles and all of a sudden the Spirit of God makes His way into your relationship and everything begins to bridge and everything begins to come to the forefront. Now you can say anything you want. Somebody can bring you any argument. They can sound like the smartest person on the planet. They can have so many degrees. It looks like alphabet soup after their name. But when God has done something for you, you will serve him until the day he returns. The scripture says that, 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 that he came to him at night. He says, I understand. I get it. You, you have to be from God because nobody could do these things unless they were from God. And Jesus answered him. He said unto him, verily I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus is an exceptional Pharisee, which means that he is very familiar with God's word up to that point. 
He knows the teachings. He knows uh, uh, the prophecy behind it. He is recognizing that Jesus is, in fact, something from God because he's doing all these miracles. And, and he says, he says, I understand you're from, from heaven or something and you're close to God or you know God or you've been around God because I see the miracles. And Jesus doesn't tell him. He goes, yeah, let me talk to you about what you're talking about. Jesus stayed immediately and effectively right on top. He looked at Nicodemus, he says, let me really blow your mind because it's just me and you and it's nighttime. Now, we don't know why he came at night. There's uh, uh, some uh, theologians believe he came at night because he was scared of the ridicule he was going to get from his, from, his, from his comrades, from the people around him. There's other people that said he came by night because he was uh, so uh, uh, interested in talking to him. He, he wanted to have a... a a, a, an in-depth conversation possibly without a bunch of interruptions because if you were around Jesus, what was going to happen is you would be heading uh, in one direction and then somebody would pull on him and he would stop what he was doing where he was going and he would heal somebody here, then he would heal somebody here, then he would heal somebody here and when you were talking to Jesus, there'd be three or four conversations going on at the same time. In other words, he's the same yesterday, today and forever. When you pull on Jesus, it doesn't hurt anybody else's opportunity to pull on Jesus. He's not weakened by you asking him. He's not weakened by him aiding you. He's not weakened in any way, shape, or form. But the Bible makes it clear that Nicodemus is coming to him at night. And I like the idea, whether he was there in, uh, in secret or whether he was there because he wanted a long conversation. I just like the idea that God is available at night. Because sometimes that's the best time to pray. You're done with work, the kids are asleep, you've already done everything you need to do, and it's sometimes your mind just starts wondering. I just, I just wonder, sometimes we just ought to get that Nicodemus anointing on us where we go, man, I tell you what I'm gonna do, long about the midnight hour, I'm not gonna worry. Long about the midnight hour, I'm not gonna stress. Long about the midnight hour, I'm not gonna be filled with concern. I'm just gonna talk to the one who is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. So Jesus is available in the midnight hour. Now he's available in the midnight hour, not just uh, 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 in the natural, meaning when the sun goes down, he's available in the midnight hour in your life. When all hell is raging against you, he is one breath, one twinkling, one moment away. And now, now, now I feel obligated to tell you this. There are seasons in God. Somebody say seasons. There are seasons in God. And I've lived for God uh, to the best of my ability my whole life. There's some patches there where I probably wasn't living as strong as others. I can't take credit for it. My parents were the ones who uh, raised me in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So when I got older, I wouldn't depart from it. But what happens is really simple. Uh, there are seasons and times in God. And there are some seasons where it feels like it's difficult to get to heaven. It, it, it's difficult to not necessarily get there, but to access heaven. It's difficult to experience the tangible manifestation of God. Has anybody ever been in a dry season of your life and it was just difficult to reach God? But then there's seasons like New Heights Church is in right now where literally it's like the veil of the temple has been torn in two in front of our face and we can step over into the holiest of holies at any point, at any time. This is where we are today. The midnight hour of your life might not mean it's dark. It might just feel dark in your soul. It might feel dark on the inside. Well, we're in a season right now where the uh, prescription for your ailment is simple. To close your eyes, to lift your hands, and say, more than I've ever needed you before, I need you now. And if you would come into my life and move on my behalf, I know I would experience your glory. It's in that moment, in that midnight hour, where Jesus will do for you and for me exactly what he has done for Nicodemus. He'll begin to answer questions that you didn't ask. He said, I know you're from God. And all of a sudden, Jesus is going, look, tomorrow morning, everybody's going to be back. Tomorrow morning, you got to get up and go to work. 
Tomorrow morning, you're going to have to do everything that you had to do before. Tomorrow morning, you're going to have to pack the kids. Tomorrow morning is coming. I don't have much time to talk to you, Nicodemus. Can I call you Nick? Okay, Nick, listen, here's the thing. I don't have that much time. I know you think you have questions, but I have more answers than you have questions. Let me just give you the answer and just bypass all the questions. He says, here's the deal. Nobody can enter, throw all those scriptures back up there. Nobody can enter into the kingdom of God unless they be born again. That word again is a very interesting word in the original. It, it, it's more like, it doesn't mean uh, like, the way we, like the way we say it exactly. It does mean again or another, but it also means from on high or from above. You have to be born from on high. See, you don't get a choice who your parents are. Maybe you have great parents in the natural. Maybe they did everything that you wanted. Maybe they had a pony for you at your birthday party. Maybe they did everything that you wanted. I don't know. Maybe they, they fulfilled all uh, of your dreams and it was just wonderful. Or, or maybe you're like the bulk of society and, and you go, you know what? There's some stuff in my childhood and my past that I just really wish hadn't happened. And maybe for a certain amount of time, you have carried a grudge against one or both of your parents. And you, you've had the thought, and maybe you never enunciated, and maybe you never even allowed it to stay in your mind, but it's in there in that deep part of your mind that nobody else talks about, the part that only you know about. And you sit there and you think, I really wish that hadn't happened. I wish, I think somebody could have done it differently. I wish that hadn't happened. But here's the problem with our, our, our natural parents. Our natural parents, you don't have a say. But there is a parent available to you. There is a parent available to you from above. And this parent is, is maybe partially like some of the parenting that you experience, but in reality, he's really like nothing because nothing can be compared to him. Things can be, can be uh, uh, remotely or maybe in a, in, in a in just for conversation talked about in the same regard, but nothing can be compared to him because he's incomparable. There is nothing that compares to who he is. So if we tried to talk about his goodness, we would lose our voices for the amount of good we would speak of because this parent that you have the opportunity to be born again or to be born from above into the family of God, it changes everything and every part part of your life from the moment you make that decision and that's why the devil so despises when people give their life to Jesus because you go from a family that you had no choice to be in to now you are born again into the family of choice Many of us, you, we have family that, 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 that were blood kin and we might not even do anything for, but there are certain things that we just cannot commune about because they are living so differently. They believe so differently. It, 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 we love them. We want the best for them, but it's just divergent to what we have decided to believe. But there is a family of choice, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that gets together once or twice a week. We come to a place like this. We read from God's holy holy book and when we get together faith begins to move around in the room the atmosphere begins to shift the power of God begins to come on and all of a sudden a bunch of people who are not born originally into a family but were born again into a family begin to experience the promises of God that can never be taken away the devil hates the idea of you being born again that's why when your friends are talking to you, I, I was talking to this one guy the other day and, and bless his heart, but he's sitting there and, he, and I'm, I'm trying to witness to him and he's, he's saying all the cliche junk that people say that don't want to believe in Jesus. And I'm sitting, he's like, you know, Christians this, hypocrite that. And I'm like, yeah, Christians are hypocrites. What's your point? I didn't ask you to serve Christians. I asked you to serve Christ. But I'm talking to this guy and we're having a conversation and he's, 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 I'm just thinking, I'm like, if you knew the Jesus that I knew, you would not be trying to argue against him. You would actually be arguing for him because when you get into the family, everything shifts. If you think I'm joking, you let the UPS man walk in your house and stick his dirty boots on your coffee table. 
Now your grandkids can walk in there, they can do a dance on the coffee table, they can jump around the coffee table, but the UPS man better not get on your coffee table because he's not family. When you get born again into the family of God, it is a completely different set of rules. All of a sudden, if God be for us, who can stand against us begins to resonate because you don't see God as some mythical creature out to destroy you. He is now a good, good father who longs to bless his children. It's a new birth that takes place. It's a shift. The Bible says in, in Genesis 14, 318 men born in his house. That means they talked like Abram. They walked like Abram. They, when they started to shave, Abram probably showed them how to shave. When they started to buy deodorant, which hopefully was at a young age since they were boys. I got boys and girls. Let me just tell you something. Boys ought to start wearing deodorant about six months old. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Three hundred and eighteen men. They looked like him. They walked like him. They smelled like him. They fought like him. They hunted like him. They fished like him. They read the Bible like him. In other words, Dad, if you don't read the Bible, that's how they will read the Bible. They walk like him. They talk like him. They said, when I get old, I want some of those sandals because that's what Father Abraham wore. I want that sword because that's the one Father Abraham used. They were born in the camp. They were born in the house. When you are born in the kingdom of God, all of a sudden, it starts to make complete sense that you are an heir and a joint heir with Christ. You begin to walk around and you're going, man, I'm not doing that. I'm an heir and a joint. That's so beneath me. I wouldn't need, I'm not going to walk to the right. I'm not going to walk to the left. I'm going to keep my eyes so focused on who God has called me to be. I don't have time for this drama in my life. I know you want to talk about Susie again. I don't want to talk about Susie. I'm an heir and a joint heir with Christ Jesus. <laughs> Things begin to shift. When you become a member of the family. The Bible says that Jesus is answering a question that Nicodemus is not even asking. Nicodemus asks another question. He says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter back into his mother's womb and be born? Can he jump back in his mom's tummy? How is this really going to happen? And Jesus answered him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's trying to describe it to him. He says, there's a first birth. I get it. But I'm talking about a spiritual thing. I'm talking about something that changes your DNA. I'm talking about something that changes everything about your life, not something about your life. When you become a Christian, and listen to me, I mean really a Christian, a Christ one. When you come to the realization that without him you are nothing, and with him you can do all things. The level of gratitude, gratitude begins to increase at such an exponential pace that it's very difficult to even put it in terms. That's why when Jesus talked, he talked about the reality of your ability to perceive is tied up in your birth. He said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. When you have ears to hear, that means you have bought into who God is. You have bought into who his son is. You are born again into the kingdom. Now things that did not make sense before begin to make perfect sense without any wavering or questioning in your mind because you were incapable to understand. But now that you are born again, now that you are born into the spiritual life that God has intended for you, now all of a sudden you can perceive things that you could not perceive before. 
You walk in your house before you get saved and you think, oh, it's just the house. You walk in your house after you get saved and all of a sudden something says, go check your kid's room. You walk in your kid's room and something's going on that you don't approve of and all of a sudden it could have been a horrible thing. Now it's a tiny thing because the Holy Spirit is speaking to you because those who have ears to hear can hear. You come to my house, me and my dad are going to have a conversation. We're going to be talking and we might be having six conversations at one time. Hey, Dad, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. Insurance, this, insurance, that. Uh, business, this, business, that. Genesis, Exodus, Revelation. All this, all that. Kids, mom, dogs, horses, uh, cats, goats. And you might not catch any of what we're saying, but we are family. We have been talking this way forever. Don't look at me like that. I know your family's crazy, too. <laughs> My God, sir, I tell you what. Go look at your kitchen table. Y'all sitting there talking. I couldn't understand a word y'all were saying. Half of it be flowing in about six different languages. I'm not talking about tongues either. I'm talking about some dialect that came from your household. (laughs) That's because you have ears to hear because you are family. You begin to make up words. You begin to make up grunts. And you begin to make up noises. And before you know it, you can hear what's going on. You can walk into your house and you can hear if something is correct or incorrect. You can hear if something is going well or something is not going well. All because you have ears to hear because you are born into that family. When you are born again into the kingdom of the Most High God, now you are not just destined for warfare. You are destined for warfare and you are destined for victory in the warfare. The devil hates it because before you get born again, it's a maybe on whether or not he could beat you. I don't know. We'll have to see. They might be have a friend that's a Christian, maybe something. Maybe somebody would pray for them. I'd hate, you know, I don't know. But all of a sudden, you become a Christian and you get surrounded by the Shekinah glory of God himself. You are marked. You you begin to walk around and you're walking around like somebody that has got protective uh, service, that has a secret service all around you. The Bible says the angels of God are called to to have charge or or to have protection services around you. God doesn't even want you twisting your ankle, the Bible says. Oh, I don't know. God doesn't care about that. Okay, let's bring your kids up here. You tell me which one you want to break their ankle. Oh, don't go. If you put it like that, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. God said you got to be born again because when you go like a child, now you can understand. The Bible says we are all God's children, not we're all God's adults. Because if he said we were all God's adults, now we have to start weighing out. Well, what kind of a dad is he to an adult? Is like a friend dad now? Is like a, like, a, like a dad like doesn't ever talk to anybody? What kind of relationship is it? It's always a father and his child. Amen. That's good. Come on, give God a hand of prayer. He doesn't want you born again. Because when you are born again, you are destined for victory and destined for for greatness. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Everybody say flesh. flesh. Everybody say yuck. yuck. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Everybody say spirit. spirit. Everybody say yay. yay. We all have a flesh. It's the way it is. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. It's a completely different thing when you are born into the kingdom. What you have done before is wiped away and everything becomes new. I'm going to tell you one more story and then we're going to pray. The Bible says that King David had a very good friend named Jonathan. Jonathan and him had a covenant together. The problem was Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul was the previous king of Israel, but David was anointed to be the next king of Israel. Do you follow me? 
So the Bible says that David refused to kill Saul, even though he could have several times, to the point of sneaking up behind him, cutting off a part of his clothing and said, look, man, I could kill you anytime I want to, but I'm not going to touch God's anointed. Somebody say, don't touch God's anointed. That'll keep you alive today, by the way. So the Bible says that David and Jonathan were just in total covenant. And, and then all of a sudden, had nothing to do with David. David didn't do it. There was a, there was a battle, and, and King Saul was killed, and Jonathan was killed. So the king and the heir by natural birth, which was Jonathan, the heir by natural birth was killed. And the Bible says that David one day after that, after he'd become king of Israel, he was sitting there, and, and he said, he said, here, he said, man, I, I wish there was somebody out of the house of Saul that I could bless for Jonathan's sake. King David is sitting on the throne. The Bible says David is a man after God's own heart. A lot of times when we see David in the Bible, it's very uh, uh, symbiotic of how God acts. Not all the time, but sometimes. This is one of those. He's sitting on the throne and he says, I wish there was somebody out of the house of Saul that I could bless for Jonathan's sake. In other words, I wish there was somebody that was in covenant with the Father that I could bless because of the Son. The Bible says now that Jesus is seated at the right hand of our Father in heaven. The Bible says he's constantly making intercession for you and for me. And I believe he's saying, Dad, if you really want to bless somebody, and I know you want to bless me. I wish you would bless them because of what I have done. In other words, I wish there was somebody related to the Father that could be blessed because of the Son. The Bible says that David prayed this prayer and all of a sudden the servant comes up and he says, he says his name was Ziba. He says, he says, there is one that's out of the house of Saul. But he says he's lame in his feet. Doesn't even say his name. David perks to attention on the throne and he says, he says, wait a minute. He says, he said, there's somebody alive? He said, bring him to me. The Bible says he goes and the, 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 the man was in a place called Lodibar, which literally just means barren, desolate. Sometimes when you're far from God, it can feel extremely barren and desolate in your life. The Bible says that he was lame in his feet because when the overthrow took place, his handmaid, the lady who was taking care of him, was running. Uh, the, the man's name was Mephibosheth. He was running. She was running with him, and she dropped him, and he was club-footed. Couldn't hardly walk. He was lame. And the Bible says they go, and they get him from Lodibar. In other words, at the command of the king, they went and rescued him from a place of barrenness. They brought him in front of the king and the Bible says that he, that he fell on his face. The reason he fell on his face is pretty simple. In those days, if a king overthrew another king, they would kill all the descendants out of the lineage to make sure there wasn't an uprising. Mephibosheth was the grandson of Saul, which means after Jonathan, he would have been in line for the crown. The scripture says that Mephibosheth falls on his face and he begins to say, Oh God, why do you look upon me, a dead dog that I am? He thought he was just an old rotten dead dog. He had no idea what was happening in his life. Coming from a place of barrenness, all of a sudden one of the servants of the king, which actually Ziba was out of Saul's house. The Bible says that he's there and David looks at him and he says, He doesn't answer his question. He just begins to give him answers to questions he wasn't asking. This is what the Lord does when you want to know, when you really want to know him. Sometimes going to God with a bunch of questions, all it does is, is, is muddle your mind. Sometimes the best thing to ask is, Lord, would you just speak to me? Because he has this way of delivering what you need when you don't know what you need. Well, how does he do that? When your baby's two years old and crying in their crib, you know what they need. They don't know what they need. They can't even reach the medicine cabinet. We're all God's children. So the scripture says that Mephibosheth 
falls on his face and, and, and David begins to tell him. He begins to tell him, he says, let me tell you something. Everything's changing in your life. I'll paraphrase. He says, I know your dad. Before he went on, him and I were extremely close. Until I die, you will eat at my table. You will live in my home. You will have all the land of your father restored unto you. You will have all the goods of your father restored unto you. And never again will you be taken to a place of barrenness. Because what you are is you are in covenant with me because of the son of the father. Amen. You see, Mephibosheth had no idea that it was his birthright because of the covenant David had with Jonathan, his daddy. It was his birthright to be in the presence of the king. You see, he told Nicodemus, I know you're trying to figure it out, but you gotta be born again so you can have ears to hear. What I'm telling you is that you have a birthright when you are born again or born from above. Where now you don't walk in on your merit, you walk in on the covenant that he has with his son. It is a birth issue. The Bible says that Abram took 318 men that were born in his house. To Abram, they would be family. To Abram, they would be as close as anyone else and as they would have eaten the same food he ate. They would have traveled. They would have had the stories of, you remember when we had to cross that one creek and we had to get the logs and lay them over there and ha, 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 you fell in the water. You begin to have all these stories about your experiences with God and you stop having to live off everybody else's. I tell you stories because I love to and because it's what I'm called to do. But the reality is, is God has a story for you. He wants you to have experiences with him. Can I say it differently? He wants you to get it all back. But it starts with a birth. I can tell just by looking around, by all the heads nodding, and even some of the, the damp eyeballs where you just feel like the tears are flowing. It's just a season for it. It's just the presence of the Lord. But there's something about being born again. I can tell almost everyone here has had that wonderful experience. But I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment because maybe today's the first time you've ever really heard what it means to be born again and the access that it grants. You become a family member. And a family has a completely different set of rules. That means you have access where you did not have access before. If you're here today and you've never been born again, you've never been born from above, you've never accepted the opportunity to be in the family of God, or maybe, maybe you, it's just really clear to you now. Maybe you have ears to hear. Maybe you would say it differently. Maybe you would say, you know what, Pastor? preacher with exceptional hair and a striped shirt. I used to walk strong with God, but I'm backslidden. I'm like that prodigal son in the Bible. I've gone away from him. Today's the day when I just want to come home. I, I want to live the family life. If that's you, I'm going to give you that opportunity to so if you're here today and you've never been born again, or you say, you know what, I'm just backslidden, Lord. When I count to three, I want you to lift your hand, and with an uplifted hand, you're saying, oh God, remember me, and he really, really will. One, two, three, lift your hands. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand. 
I see that hand. Is there anyone else? We'll wait just a moment. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you, bro. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Just a moment. Come out of that place of barrenness, of desolate life. Come right into the presence of the king. And he'll say to you what was said to that young man, Mephibosheth. He'll say, no, 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 no. He said, you're not here to pay for any sins. You're here to have a seat at the table because somebody has paid for your sins. If that's you, and you want to make that decision today, just lift your hand right now. We're about to pray. I don't want to miss you, though. There you are. If you lifted your hand or you wanted to, I want you to pray this after me. Matter of fact, church, help us pray. Say, oh God, I come to you now and I ask you to save me. Write my name in your book. I believe Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead for my victory. I'm a Christian. I'm in the family now. And I don't care what the devil thinks. I have a seat at the table. My price, my price has been paid. I'm a child of God. Forgiven and set free. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, praise God. If you made that decision today, we'd love to hear about it. Fill out that card, drop it off by the tent. But listen, Christians do three things. Number one, Christians pray. Talk to God like you're talking to your best friend. Number two, oh, thank you, Lord. I feel the presence of the Lord in here. We're going to pray in just a minute. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, uh, Christians do two things, three things. The second they do is they read the Bible. If you don't know where to start, start with the book of John. You see how easy it is to read? We just read it out loud. Start with the book of John. It'll paint a beautiful picture for you of who Christ is. Number three, Christians go to church. If you don't go to a good church, this is your new church home. Don't miss a Sunday or a Wednesday if you can help it. But over here is our board. And this is a very special thing. So what we're doing this summer is on July 16th, so that's two Sundays from now, we're going to receive a very special seed offering. And that seed offering is our way of pursuing that which was taken from us. We're going to retrieve all of our stolen property in the name of Jesus. Uh, the board started with 318, but we have so many wonderful, faithful people uh, that most of them are gone. But there were 318 cards, and each one of these cards has a number on it. So what we're asking you to do is for every person that comes to this church, every man, woman, and we're, my, my wife and I, we're getting our kids involved. Matter of fact, uh, I've, I've taken, well, I took one all three services. This is not to tell you what I'm doing, but either way, I took one all three services on Sunday. And uh, my little boy came and, and he took one. He says, I got one too, Dad. I said, great. How much was it? 304 more dollars. So praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm not scared. I told y'all Sunday. Let me tell you, I'm a spearhead. That's right. Some of y'all, before this year's over, you're going to become a spearhead. Amen. Spearhead is the first in. Right. I want to be the first in. I'm not playing games with my seed. I want a harvest. I want souls. I want all my family saved, living for God, fulfilling what God has called them to do. So each one of these cards has a number on it. Uh, and what we're doing is on July 16th, we're going to receive that special offering, but we're asking you to give that number. So uh, like, for instance, this one is 186. On July 16th, we're asking you to bring $186 uh, dollars for that offering. Now, this is above your normal tithe and offering. This is something we're doing in the middle of the summer 
when everything is going on and we're just saying we are going to pursue in the name of Jesus. We are born again. We are in the family of God. We are being trained. And in the name of Jesus, we are armed. And by our seed, we are going to pursue, somebody say amen, amen. that which was stolen from us. Uh, so we'll, we'll leave this thing up here. Uh, and, and when we uh, have prayer partners in just a minute, if you have not gotten a card yet, or maybe you, you've gotten one, you say, you know what, I just want to step out even more. I want to do more. Uh, I'm asking you to come get a card. Take it home. Pray over that card. Be believing God that the family members that you want saved are going to be saved. Believe in God that the joy that you're wanting back is coming back. But uh, uh, we're just asking that everyone, every man and woman, if you want to get your kids involved, get your kids involved. What we're going to do with it is real simple. We're going to do everything we can to storm the gates of hell in the Brazos Valley. That means we're negotiating right now with different billboards around the area so that we can make sure people know that there is a place where they can be taught the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because for us, we don't want to just assume everybody knows. Everybody knows what assuming does. But the other side of it, Trey told me. But the other side of it is simple. We're not just going to assume that somebody else is doing what God has called all Christians to do. No, we're going to do our part. So we're going to worship in just a moment. We're going to have our prayer partners up here. If you need prayer for anything, it's going to be the opportunity for you to have that. We're going to believe God that miracles are going to happen. We're having miracles happen all the time. A lot of healings. We had some ears open the other day. Uh, another lady sent in a, a thing to the church was, was just dramatically healed of a condition. So whatever you're going through, whether it's a physical thing, whether it's mental or emotional, doesn't matter if it's a big thing or a little thing. It all matters to God. We're going to worship, but I'm, I'm going to ask you also while we are worshiping, if you have not gotten a card, I'm going to ask you to just come out of your chair, get that card, and be ready July uh, 16th for that special offering. If you know you can't be there, if you know you can't be there, uh, we'll have the ushers put a bucket right here. You're welcome to give that today. It's also available online. There'll be a drop down at, at where the online giving is, but still please come take a card so we don't have like 15 people giving $215. Uh, uh, we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to do it. Amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet. You're welcome here, oh God, you're welcome here. Let your presence and your glory fill this house. You're welcome here, you're welcome here. You're welcome in this place, almighty God, you're welcome here. We give you honor and all praise. To you our hands are raised. We welcome you. We honor you. We welcome you. We give you all the praise. We lift on high your holy name. We welcome you. Let your presence overflow. Let your power and your glory show. You're welcome here. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
just to come up. If you need prayer for anything, don't just don't leave this building without being prayed over in this atmosphere. Some things happen. You can pick something up in this kind of atmosphere. It can change your whole life. If you're here and you have not yet uh, partnered with us on the 318 Pursuit, I'm going to ask you to do that as well. Just come up and grab the card, take it back and pray over it. If you know you won't be here for that service, you're welcome to go ahead and deposit that in one of the buckets at the front or do so online. Every hand lifted now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, for every need that's going to come to your house today, every need that's going to be brought to you tonight, I agree that you will meet it according to your word. Lord, for every person who's partnering with us to go and take back everything the enemy stole, I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to them about their part, and I pray, Lord God, that you would raise their faith in the process to believe you at your word. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Amen. Come out of your chair right now if you need prayer for anything. Our prayer partners will be here at the front. They'll be right here. If you have not yet come and gotten your card, come grab your card. Just take it with you. In Jesus' name. We
one of y'all leave? Huh? This week? Oh, come on here. Wonderful. Come on up here, fam. Face the crowd there. Stand down here so I can see you. That's all right. I just want to be able to touch your shoulders. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to Haiti, right? We're about to go to Haiti. Extend your right hand, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. As you send out laborers, the Bible says that the harvest is great, the harvest is white, the laborers are few. I thank you, Lord God, for sending out laborers. I thank you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that you are going before them you are opening doors even now. I come directly against any plan of the devil, the wiles of the devil, your Bible would call it. And I pray in the name of Jesus for supernatural protection from the plane ride to every vehicle, to every time that a, that a tool is in their hand, there will be no harm in the name of Jesus, but they will be exponentially effective for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name, safely sent out and safely returned in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Before the week's over, 
you will see my, listen to this, undeniable hand at work. I have noticed, I have counted, I have allotted, and I will repay, says the Lord in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask you to bless your people coming in, bless them going out. You've been so good to us. Bless them in the city and bless them in the field. For all those watching online, I pray the blessing of the Lord overtake you. I pray in the name of Jesus that you be blessed on your job site. I come against sickness in the name of Jesus Christ. I call you healed. In Jesus' name, bless them, Lord God. Let your power reside in, our, in and amongst our midst on a constant basis. In Jesus' mighty, holy name, amen, amen. God bless you. We'll see you Sunday. Don't forget about the VBS meeting. Hey, guys. We just want to thank you for joining us online. We hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. Here at New Heights, we are passionate about two things, loving people and pointing them to Christ. So help us by liking, sharing, and commenting on everything you see come across our social media. It means the world to us. If you like what you've experienced today, you can also revisit this message you just watched or any other sermon at newheightschurch.info. We hope you have a great week. We'll see you next time.